When you think about substance abuse, you never think that it will happen to your family. And when it hit our family the way it did with my sister, I promised myself that I would get the word out that the opioid addiction does not discriminate. It happens to the least of us, to the most of us. My sister was a doctor. She had her PhD in education. She was a minister, just the person who you would least suspect to be addicted to opiates. People need to understand that the opioid addiction is a physiological addiction. So just like I crave water, it's the same way people who have the addiction with opiates, they crave the drug. Initially, my sister was prescribed opiates for knee and back pain. I really believe that she wasn't able to get the prescriptions by doctors anymore. So she turned to the next best thing that she could to get that fixed. And that's when she started reaching out to negative influences um, and drug dealers. I'm a federal probation officer. I deal with this kind of stuff all the time. But when it happened in my family, it, it, it just, it, it caught us all by surprise. My sister and I were extremely close. Uh, we were best friends. If you saw her, you saw me. And when it hit so close to home, I, you know, I make referrals to drug treatment all the time. I never in a million years thought that I would have to do this for my sister. But I did. And it was tough. But the addiction was so powerful She was in a lot of denial. She did a lot of deflecting. She pointed the finger at other things going on, but she never accepted responsibility. And it was, was very hard. She was such a strong human being. She was like, she was my rock. She was my everything. She always came to my rescue. She was more than you know, just a big sister. Like, she would tell anybody, don't mess with my sister. You know, that's, that's the kind of person she was. So when this happened, I think in my mind, I thought, well, I, I knew that she would be able to beat this. If anybody could beat this, Karen could beat it. And so when COVID hit and everybody was on lockdown, there were signs, but I don't, I didn't recognize those signs until after the fact. I had to go through grief counseling because six months prior to her dying, I had already lost her. And I, 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 yeah, I had already lost her. So I, I, I actually started going through grief counseling because I knew at that point there was nothing else I could do. My sister was very charismatic, and my sister was a very strong, motivational speaker, a very powerful minister. And she knew that Bible inside and out. And when she started to use scripture to justify some of the things she had done, I knew this isn't, this, this isn't Karen. This, this is not my sister. Because 
she was the type of person, she didn't tolerate foolishness. She didn't tolerate, you know, people making dumb mistakes. Her thing was, you're doing this because you want to do it, and I'm not going to be a part of it. That's the kind of person she was. And so when her addiction got exposed, I started noticing that she's not accepting responsibility for the addiction. Karen, I think, was dealing with some depression. I think that she was just going through a lot. And so when she died, my husband and I was like, you know, everybody's blaming everybody, but nobody's blaming Karen. And it's not something that Karen wanted. I know she didn't. I know my sister did not want to die, but the drug was just so powerful. And because she was such a strong person, weakness just was not in her vocabulary. It, it just wasn't. And so probably to admit that I'm weak, I'm powerless, Against it, against you know this addiction, um, she just couldn't do it. She did go in substance abuse treatment once, though. I was so proud of her. She was weaned off of the the pills, and things were going great. Things were really going great, but she relapsed. And so when she relapsed, when the conversation was, I've been calling my counselor, but she's not calling me back. Okay, now the probation officer hat is kicking in. Okay, yeah. And she would say it over and over and she would be so convincing. Oh my God, she would be so convincing. I've been calling that counselor and that counselor's not been calling me back. And so finally, I just had to tell her, okay, okay. So she was sick. I was at work and got a phone call that the paramedics were at her house and they couldn't resuscitate her. And her husband had come home from work, working on a night job. He came home from work and found her passed out, unresponsive. Um, she was gone. Yeah, she was gone. There were. There were pills. Um, and what she would always do is to intensify the high, she would take her pills with wine. And that's literally how she was found. That's how she died. She died at home. Yeah. When you buy drugs from a drug dealer, you don't know what you're getting. And so, essentially, that's what happened. When I got a copy of her death certificate, it said on there, fentanyl, alcohol, Xanax, and hydrocodone. And the reason on her death certificate, it said substance abuse. So that's how she died. And I know she did not commit suicide because that was that was not Karen. Um, but I do believe she overdosed because she didn't know what she was getting. I think we didn't talk about it um, like we probably should have because of pride. Um, and that is the worst thing to deal with when you're dealing with someone with, with substance abuse. It is, it's, you have to push the pride to the side. You, you can't be embarrassed um, because it happens. It happens.